You know, my, my favorite part of these conversations is always the, the kind of the fireside chat portion of it because we can, um, you know, just talk about things going on in general. And there's one, um, one area that I was reading about recently, uh, and we talked about it too in previous segments, is, is biomarkers. And I, I believe there's, there's a company working on a biomarker to actually um, uh, diagnose schizophrenia. Um, and I know that you're using some to measure the efficacy of the drug. Maybe we can talk about biomarkers for a bit and kind of how they fit into, you know, measuring uh, schizophrenics and, um, you know, and, and are they useful? And, and I don't, I don't know if you you saw this this company they called Mindex, I believe they they were coming up with something. I don't know if you had a chance to look at that, but if you did, you know, what did you think of that? And does it have some merit? I know the the Mindex thing is very early stage, uh, and they may not have released a lot of information, but. What, what are your thoughts on, on the whole biomarker thing and how it fits into diagnosis and, and measuring efficacy? You know, biomarkers are uh, uh, very important uh, in the drug discovery and development, not only for schizophrenia. Now, coming to the schizophrenia, uh, I'm not sure if there is any specific biomarker that detects schizophrenia because often neuropsychiatric conditions, there is a significant overlap. The biomarkers found in schizophrenia may also, uh, you know, will be able to see in depression and bipolar. Mm -hmm. However, what uh, you know, the level of expression of these biomarkers in individuals may vary, and then also it may vary from disease to disease. Or, for example, schizophrenia patients may have different level of expression of a particular biomarker compared to in uh, major depressive disorder patients. So to my knowledge, uh, you know, the biomarkers are good, uh, but the specific to disease, uh, I'm not sure mm -hmm. whether to that specificity, we will be able to determine this biomarker is found in only schizophrenia. But biomarkers uh, certainly add a lot of value Mm -hmm. uh, to assess, uh, in assessing treatment outcome. Yeah, right, as we talked about. Because yes. one of the things, say, a limitation what we have in schizophrenia in general neuropsychiatric space is, say, the evaluation scales are subjective in exactly. nature. Exactly, yeah. So having anything, uh, some diagnostic uh, marker, biomarker... To kind of back say, up the subjective correct. assessment. It yeah. validates the data yeah. generated based yeah. on the subjective scales. You know, um, how is schizophrenia diagnosed now? You know, I, I mean, you know, you think cancer, a lot of times will take a biopsy, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll be able to determine, you know, whether or not and what type of cancer it is. But in, in, uh, in this space, how do we diagnose uh, schizophrenia? Schizophrenia, uh, you know, by and large is based on the scales and the physician's interview with the uh, patients. So there are very well validated uh, scales like a, uh, a, the KOL in our uh, KOL uh, uh, event uh, nicely explained about the PAN scale. Mm -hmm. uh, PAN scale is a, uh, you know, it comes with a, a different version. Uh, we call it PAN's mini smaller version okay. quickly to evaluate uh, schizophrenia patients. So an experienced uh, uh, physician in this space should be able to make a, a quick assessment mm -hmm. uh, whether a patient, uh, uh, you know, uh, has a diagnosed schizophrenia or a, a very other neuropsychiatric disorder, maybe mm -hmm. depression or a bipolar. So experienced uh, uh, physicians should be able to, uh, you know, distinguish schizophrenia, bipolar, major depressive disorder based on the scales. Does it does it take a long time to diagnose somebody? Because I, you know, I I know that there, are, you know, a, a, a schizophrenic patient may have you know some time when they they appear to be normal sure. and sometimes when they don't. Yeah. So does it take a while to do that? You know, maybe there are other tests that are that are given or it's given over time. You know, early stage it is very difficult to diagnose uh, the schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Often. Right. Yeah. Mo most of the time, schizophrenia patients, they are schizophrenic as schizophrenic diagnosed uh, only when uh, when they get acu acute acute attack. Okay. Basically, the flare up of uh, positive symptom in the okay. sense to further mm -hmm. like patients are uh, having a, uh, you know, audio visual hallucination. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a too much disturbances, then uh, they are visibly disturbed. 
-hmm. At that time, they are diagnosed as a schizophrenia. Often, the other symptoms we call chronic condition, depression, negative symptoms, cognitive impairment. So these are uh, kind of starts much early, maybe a couple of months to a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then gradually, uh, when the acute stage reaches, then the positive symptoms will be very high in yeah. those patients. Yeah. Okay. Another interesting area of discussion is, is drug delivery. You know, I kind of look back on my history of, of covering companies and, and a large proportion of them are actually involved in drug delivery. You know, a lot of times it's, it's sure. delivery of a, a drug that's already been approved uh, to either in, increase its efficacy or improve the side effects or something like that. So, you know, I, I think the same is true in, in this space. Um, what, what are some of the, the drug delivery mechanisms that are used? You know, some of them are used for life cycle management. Uh, some of them, you know, are used for that and, and improved uh, convenience. Because uh, as we talked about before, you know, a lot of times patients don't, don't always take their, their medications Correct. as they should. Uh, what, do you, what do you think about that space and what are some of the options for drug delivery, um, drug delivery here? So for schizophrenia patients, uh, by and large, there are two types of uh, delivery options mm -hmm. being uh, used uh, mm -hmm. for other approved antipsychotics as well. Uh, oral medication is a uh, widely used. Uh, is that, is that like more than half people use oral or do you know? I or? believe, uh, I don't know the exact number, but okay. I believe over 70% patients take uh, okay, uh, so it's oral, a vast majority oral, either or oral. pill or capsules. Yeah, right. Okay. And, uh, uh, and that's daily, right? The daily. And then the uh, other option is a long-acting injectable. It's mm -hmm. also called depot formulation. Depot formulation. So yeah. what's that? Is, th there are different drugs are coming uh, made in different uh, formulations. Some are two weeks, some are four weeks, mm -hmm. and then the, up, up lately uh, there is an option for even three months and six months as well. Mm. Uh, so these are all recent one, three months and six months uh, uh, options. So what we know so far, based on the, uh, you know, in the last uh, several years of treatment outcome with different formulations. So in the maintenance phase where these patients require several months to years of treatment, mm -hmm. so deport formulation uh, may be more convenient uh, mm -hmm. in them because one injection would last a month or a three months so that they don't have to take every day. Often these patients, they forget to take medication. If they forget, yeah. and then maybe possibly after a couple of days or a week, they may end up in hospital. And you know, that would be uh, you know, detrimental to well, them. And I think the other problem is if you stop take, taking the medication for a while, you kind of lose the drug concentration in your blood, you lose the benefit, and it's gonna take you a while to get you back up there again. And I guess, and you can have side effects related to variations in drug levels in your system. So what happens, we call it as a relapse in this. Yeah. So yeah. in the schizophrenia patients, every time they get relapse episode, let's say treat the patients, feel better, and then continue to take medication, whether a, the drug is not working in that patient or forget to take medication for a couple of days to weeks, combination of both may end up in a hospital again mm. for acute. So what we know so far in the clinical literature, over a period of 10 years, if a patient has a multiple uh, relapse uh, episodes, eventually the big patient uh, may become treatment resistant because based on the clinical literature, every time a patient get relapse, a part of the brain uh, will get you know dent. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a dent, it's like a think it over like a computer disk. Uh, if there is a dent, you expect uh, not to function properly. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the brain. Every time the relapse episode happens to a patient, then part of the brain uh, will be kind of uh, dysfunctional. Eventually, uh, the pa you know the patient may become treatment resistant. That's very uh, dangerous because no treatment will work in those patients. Significant number of patients over 10 years of uh, you know history of schizophrenia they are treatment resistant patients. Mm -hmm. I think that was one of the <clears throat> unmet needs that was brought up in the KOL event too, was that uh, you know there are treatment resistant patients that are out there. I mean, what do we do for them if they're treatment resistant? What's the, what's the approach? See, you know, <clears throat> currently- Just try, and try a different, slightly different drug that hits on different no, receptors or- the, No, the currently uh, there is a, not any uh, uh, 
suitable options for them. Okay. So what we do uh, in the clinical treatment, uh, if no treatment resistant patients are often given the last resort uh, antipsychotic called clozapine. Mm -hmm. Clozapine is a very potent drug, but has a lot of other side effects. Mm -hmm. But one thing what we have seen in the recent uh, clinical literature, significant number of treatment resistant patients have a high level of neuroinflammation. There are clinical literature supports that if a drug is able to address neuroinflammation in these patients, mm -hmm. that may benefit them to yeah, address there's, that. Yeah, there's benefits yeah. that's yeah. Uh, spread out from that. Yeah. You know, I, I wanted to get back to the um, the theme of uh, uh, of the, the long acting depot that we talked about. I think Otsuka, the Japanese pharma, they their patent uh, for Abilify. Mm -hmm. I think they have long acting one month long. I think for Abilify is running out. So two things on that. One, I think they're coming up with that longer acting to kind of replace it, but also they're going to see declining revenues from that. And I don't know how many people are going to be able to switch over from one month to two month to three month. Um, but it seems like it opens up an opportunity for an uh, in development company with a great product <laughs> to kind of fill that hole in their portfolio. So what do you what do you think about that? Is, is do you think a company like Atsuko, which is losing protection on on a you know multi billion dollar uh, asset? You know they're they're hungrier for something new or um, i see you smiling so i'll let you, you go. know the <laughs> you know the one thing to remember here the long-acting medication every antipsychotic currently in the market cannot be made long-acting because lo to make a long-acting uh, medication ideally it has to be concentrated enough or, or yes potent, correct. potent enough correct. i guess it's potent enough if the oral dose is ideally the below 50 milligram, mm -hmm. it is a lower the dose uh, or the higher the potency, mm -hmm. it is a, uh, you know, easy to make the long acting or a, we call loading. Yeah. So if the oral dose is over 50 milligram, then think it over if it is a drug is, uh, you make a, a monthly dose. Yeah, the mass of the drug is going to be too correct. big to kind of fit in yeah. your arm correct. or the muscle so or whatever. Yeah. The ideally, the long acting uh, formulation the oral dosage should be low, mm -hmm. uh, below 50. Okay. That, yeah. uh, you know, uh, based on the property of drug molecule, uh, most of the time it would it is possible to make long-acting drug. We are also working on mm -hmm. long-acting mm -hmm. uh, because say, our drug, uh, in an acute phase, it is a 50 milligram showed robust efficacy. Mm -hmm. In the maintenance phase, we believe it should be either 15 or a, uh, or a close to that dose okay. level. 15, so, which is well 15. below the 50 kind of Correct. threshold. Be that, because yeah. this uh, long-acting medication is given the, in the maintenance phase. Mm -hmm. They are stable patient, mm -hmm. mild schizophrenia patients. Right, they don't patients. need the loading dose. Right? Correct. Yeah. So ideally, with the 15 to 20 milligram dose, it is a readily can be made, especially with our drug, mm -hmm. uh, at least a month. Or a, We are trying two types of long-acting. Mm -hmm. One is a, a monthly uh, uh, dose. Other one is ideally either 60 or 90 days dose. Okay. So. Yeah. I mean, well, that's great. Cause I mean, we can already see that, you know, the patent protection you have now for oral abroxazine yeah. can be extended out much further with these long acting opportunities. Uh, you know, just one last thing I wanted to touch on, sure. um, you know, as probably most investors know the last couple months of 2023 were pretty strong for the life sciences. Uh, we saw a pretty, pretty big run there after, after two years or two and a half years of rough times. But I've also heard uh, recently that there are a lot more conversations. I mean, I've talked to a lot of CEOs recently and they, they just note that there's a lot more conversations going on with big pharma. You know, if, if we think about it, uh, a lot of these big companies are seeing patent cliffs. I mean, I like to bring up Pfizer because, you know, they had the, the vaccine obviously, and, and that's, you know, <laughs> rolling over. They have a lot of money, but not a lot of, you know, new, new products. So, um, what what do you think of that? Have you seen a pickup in conversations, and uh, is that is that good news for what we might see in twenty twenty four? You know, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, the partnering activities, uh, especially in the neuropsychiatric space, happened in the last uh, M and A activities last right. year. Right in December, we had two. That's a good deals. news yeah. that uh, uh, created a kind of buzz in yeah, the yeah. <laughs> in the field. We're all buzzing. Yes, about it. Yeah. and then again, uh, we as a, a company, uh, you know. Uh, a mid-sized company, we uh, look for uh, opportunities for big pharma uh, for potential partnership or a co-development. 
uh, to commercialize, especially our drug, biloxazine, uh, based on the broad spectrum activity. Mm -hmm. We would like to extend uh, or develop this drug for beyond schizophrenia to mm -hmm. multiple indications. Mm -hmm. That well, I, I th you know, one thing I was going to yeah. mention is, when we talked about this uh, earlier, is that it, uh, if the, the size of the um, schizophrenia market is what you said, eight billion right now? It's currently six, close six, to nine billion. Close it to is nine. Anticipated but the, 12 the billion. The size of all of the potential indications, yeah. which other antipsychotics have achieved, um, approved, and is about ten times that amount. So it's 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 pretty big if you're able to kind of pick these off one by one and, and you know conduct the the pivotal trials to to get approval on them. So um, is that about right, 10 times the size, or maybe it's even more? I don't want to underestimate. You know, the total major indications, if you look at uh, bipolar, schizophrenia, and then major depressive disorder and ADHD, it's over $40 billion. $40 market. billion, okay. So yeah. if a drug captures even a 1%, 2% of the market, it's a huge, yeah. uh, you know, sales. Yeah. So what we believe, it also requires capital to develop clinical development for these indications. Mm -hmm. So especially for, uh, with, uh, with us, uh, Reviva, after the top line data announcement, uh, we received uh, several inbound requests from pharma partners, both uh, global partners as well as uh, regional partners. Mm -hmm. uh, we are, so a few of them are currently uh, doing due diligence. But right. we as a company, you know, uh, ideally looking for a, a global partner mm -hmm. to uh, extend the therapeutic benefit beyond schizophrenia too quickly. But as a company, uh, you know, we have the option uh, open to go on our own if, uh, you know, uh, required resources, uh, if we can uh, raise, uh, you know, that uh, we, we have the options open, yeah. uh, whether to partner, uh, if you find a good partner, co-development or a licensing, or else uh, we have the expertise uh, uh, in-house to take the molecule to uh, market as well. So that's Great. where we stand at this time. Good thing is having good data. You have options. That's a good you have thing. good data and good that's, options. That's correct. So yeah. <laughs> you get both. Well, yeah. Dr. Bhatt, yeah. thank you so much. I think we had a great conversation today about a bunch of different topics that I think investors will really like. Uh, again, we had uh, Dr. Laxman Orion Bhatt, the CEO of Revival Pharmaceuticals, who recently completed its recovery trial and is conducting its second of two um, pivotal phase three trials in Berloroxazine coming up soon called Recover 2. And uh, as we finish out, when do we think Recover 2 will start and when do we expect uh, that to complete? We we'll finish on that note. We anticipate starting a, a second uh, trial, Recover 2 trial, sometime by end of next month. Okay. So, and then... Uh, end of March? End of March. So 2024? Uh, 2024. And then typically uh, the... Uh, this type of studies uh, completed in the historical data around a uh, 14 to 16 months time frame. Okay. So, so considering that historical middle data, of 2025, we expect to complete fall the, 2025. We no no we expect to complete the recover two trial sometime in uh, early Q2 uh, 